Sewing and Learning, Isabella Beecher Hooker and the American Women's Suffrage Movement. My name is Brianne Greenfield and I am the Executive Director of the Harry Beecher Stowe Center, a historic house museum, program center, and research library in historic Hartford, Connecticut. This program is an opportunity for us to celebrate the suffrage centennial and to sew a replica of Isabella Beecher Hooker's American suffrage liberty style hat, a treasured object from the Stowe Center collections. We are joined today by Dr. Shirley Vida, Executive Director of the Enfield Shaker Museum. Um, Dr. Vida holds a PhD in American Civilization. She is one of the most versatile historians that I know. Um, she's a museum professional, award-winning educator, and editor with 30 years in experience in museums, universities, and state humanities councils as well. Her areas of expertise include United States history, American material, visual, and popular culture, and of course, American women's history as well. She's the editor of the Encyclopedia of Material Culture in America, which she co-edited with Helen Shoemaker. And she's written numerous essays on articles uh, with subjects such as housekeeping, family atoms, family uh, photo albums, stereoscopes, and craftivism, which we will hear more about today as well. I met Shirley when she was presenting her research on Martha Stewart at a scholarly conference. And she started her presentation by handing out sachets, which she sewed herself to the entire audience. So you know that you are in terrific hands today for a wonderful uh, introduction to this subject. Welcome, Shirley. Thank you, Brian. Um, I do remember the sachets, and I'm sorry to not, not be able to do this in person um, and learn how to sew this hat. Um, so what I'd like to do, though, is um, inundate you with delightful photos, um, images of uh, Isabel, Isabella, excuse me, and um, a whole lot of other women in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and so I'm going to go right to the slideshow. So we're gathered here in our sewing circle today to create a liberty cap based on one found in the collections at the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. The hand-sewn suffrage hat could have been worked and worn by Isabella Beecher Hooker, but I have yet to find definitive evidence that this form of headwear is indeed hers. What we do know, however, is that Isabella would have been familiar with the symbolism of the liberty cap not only through her affiliation with the abolition and women's suffrage movements, but because the Liberty Cap appeared elsewhere in American visual and material culture. We also know she sewed. So let's begin our investigation by looking at the history of sewing circles in America. Then we will examine the history and symbolism of the Liberty Cap itself. Let's spend some time learning about Isabella Beecher Hooker's work in the women's suffrage movement and then we'll conclude by examining the movement's vexed politics and the vexed meanings in the symbols the movement's leaders used. After all that, we might discuss how political symbols, especially those addressing women's issues, work today in America. Now I'm going to confide. Wikipedia is my go-to sometimes and it often vexes me. Here's the first sentence of the entry for sewing circles. The term sewing circle usually refers to a group of people, usually women, who meet regularly for the purpose of sewing, often for charitable causes while chatting, gossiping, and or discussing. Ugh. Then I read this. In antebellum America, local anti-slavery or missionary sewing circles were complementary, not competing organizations that allowed women to act on their concerns for creating a more just and moral society. That's more like it. That's the kind of definition we want to get into. So let's see here. I'm hoping that my slideshow is going to work here. And there we go. I found the right button. There we are. Women in the United States have long used sewing and knitting needles to do the work of social justice, performing within their prescribed domestic roles with acts of charity. 
wives, mothers, and sisters wove and spun, sewed and knitted in the private realm of the household. They made and mended cloth. Here, I just, oops, I'm having a little bit of a problem here. Okay, there we go. Um, they made and mended cloth, clothing, bed linens, and quilts, and other necessarily necessary domestic textiles. They also sold their handcrafted goods to their neighbors. The fact that the women that I'm showing you are posing for their portraits with needles in hand, I think it says a lot about the, um, the way women were defined by these sorts of household crafts. Women made the choice to join with other women to sew for a cause. Here we see Benjamin Franklin's daughter, Sarah Franklin Bache, who rallied in 1780 to get women around the Philadelphia area to raise funds in support of the Continental Army. Then, at General George Washington's request, marshaled those women to purchase from the raised funds, linen and sewed by hand 2,200 shirts for the Continental Army. They met at the Cliffs, the home of Philadelphia merchant Joshua Fisher and his wife, Sarah Rowland Fisher. Even before the war, colonial women were boycotting imported British textiles and spinning their own homespun cloth of wool, linen, or silk. These daughters of liberty were writing the revolution, not with pens, um, not fighting with guns, but participating in the revolution with needles. Even in the 20th century, the nation called upon women to supply the clothing and care needs of the poor, such as the Works Progress Administration sewing projects during the Great Depression, um, the free sewing classes that you see here is a Connecticut WPA poster. I wanted to add that in for all those folks from the Nutmeg State. And you also see here um, a slide of an Ohio project, sewing project. They also produced, women were also asked to produce um, for uh, both world wars um, of the 20th century. Women's needles became patriotic weapons. Writing pens and sewing and knitting needles have historically been gendered, but in some important ways, equal. Penmanship manuals in the late 18th and 19th century United States have included instruction for both writing and sewing. I have always been intrigued by this large portrait of the Fondy family of Albany, New York. Standing at the right is 17-year-old Isaac, his arm raised in an act of oratory, of memorized reading he may be declaiming his own writing. To the, last stand, to the left, excuse me, stands his 15-year-old sister Maria, needle in hand, her arm raised in the act of sewing. Her pose parallels and complements her brother's and his hers. It is as if Maria is transcribing Isaac's words, and it is important to note that boys and girls learned how to read aloud, even if they were not taught how to handle a pen or a needle. Elizabeth Farrer wrote in 1837, a woman who does not know how to sew is as deficient in her education as a man who cannot write. Farrer also says nothing about the ability to read. Sewing circle activities included women reading aloud to others, kind of like what I'm doing here, um, and not merely chatting or gossiping as I would love to do. Sometimes, as in the case, um, of other women, reading had unintended effects. Um, there are stories, for example, of women falling asleep at, at their knitting or at their sewing while, while somebody is reading a tedious novel, for example. Importantly, sewing circles linked women within and beyond their households. Neighbors could bring their work over to one another's house for companionship and conversation while stitching. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, elite and middle-class white women gathered more formally to sew for charity, whether it was to clothe the local poor through school or church-sponsored circles. Perhaps the, most, the first widespread and concerted effort to take up the needle to supply objects for social change were America's antebellum anti-slavery fairs. <clears throat> 
1836, South Carolinian abolitionist Angelina Grimke described these women's work this way, may the points of our needles prick the slaveholders' consciences. In 1839, the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society organized an anti-slavery fair, providing for sale a variety of handcrafted goods, handkerchiefs, pin cushions and work bags, pen wipers, embroidered samplers, aprons and shawls, and quilts, not only to support the movement financially, but also to signal their political and moral stances. One of the anti-slavery movement's leaders, William Lloyd Garrison, wrote in 1847, sewing circles are among the best means for agitating and keeping alive the question of anti-slavery. Not only do they continually fan the interest of those who, per who personally engage in them, but their frequent meetings, their labor, and the products of their industry all exert an excellent influence in keeping the wrongs and the sufferings of the slave before the people. A friend in a neighboring town recently said to us, our sewing circle is doing finely and contributes very much to keep up the agitation of, th of the subject. Some one of the members generally reads an anti-slavery book or paper to the others during the meeting, and thus some who don't get a great deal of anti-slavery at home have an opportunity of hearing it within the circle. Another participant in the anti-slavery fair um, in Boston was Canadian Margaret Bracken, and she wrote a letter to the managers of that fair in 1858. This is a wonderful letter, and I think it says a lot about, uh, about the way women, when they were sewing, thought about the reasons why they were sewing, and, think, and thought about their own lives in comparison to those they were sewing for. When an old woman has patched a quilt, Bracken said, she longs to tell some of the thoughts which occupied her mind during the progress of the work. Whilst sitting at my work, I thought there must be as many stitches in my quilt as you have slaves in America. And it was a simple question in multiplication, the simple result of which is that there are about 20 times as many slaves in America as there are stitches in my quilt. And when I thought of the helpless misery endured by every individual slave through a lifetime of unprotected bondage, and though, uh, I, and thought of the omniscient eye of the just and holy and righteous God, who looks down alike on the oppressor and the oppressed, I cannot express the appalling sensation which comes over me. You're seeing on your screen a cradle quilt from the 19, from the, excuse me, the 1836 um, affair. And in that center panel, there is that hand inked inscription that you're reading. So when I think about these anti-slavery fairs, and I think about women and men um, making things, objects for sale for these fairs, I think it's the combination of discussion and solitude of concentrating on a row of stitches and the purpose in making and completing the work by hand that elevated the sewing circle from the home to the political sphere. Bracken received from the fair managers what fair visitors could also purchase a gift book right here, um, containing short fiction and poetry. On its cover was a bell referencing the nation's Liberty Bell, which was repurposed by American abolitionists to represent their cause for the liberty of the enslaved. Let's take a closer look at this um, image within the bell. We see three human figures. At the left is an enchained and kneeling man looking up to a woman standing and holding a staff with a soft peaked hat on its end. To the right is a man, arms freed and raised, the broken chain of his enslavement evident on his left arm. The women we see represents liberty, holding what most Americans would have then known as a liberty pole and a liberty cap. We can likely thank Paul Revere for introducing into colonial British American political culture the image of what many called a stick with a nightcap on it. Many of the symbols of the revolutions in the 18th century, the American and French revolutions in particular, were borrowed from ancient Rome. Then and there, an enslaved person being granted their freedom symbolized their new status 
by wearing the pileus. The pileus was also commonly worn by citizen workers. So let's take a picture of that. The pileus and the vindicta, the rod or pole, were part of the manumission ceremony called the capiri pilium, to take the cap. The cap itself symbolized both freedom and bondage. The symbol of liberation did not make sense without carrying along with it its antecedent of enslavement. So let's keep this in mind as we think about the difficult arguments about race and gender that we'll later discuss in the women suffrage movement. One of the first appearances of the Liberty Cap was during the celebrations of the repeal of the Hated Stamp Act in 1766. Here you see an illuminated obelisk designed by Paul Revere and which stood on the Boston Common um, during a celebration of the colonists' win uh, for the repeal of the Stamp Act. Let's take a closer look here. Um, the Romus, Roman god of liberty, Libertas, also uses the Pileus and the Vindicta, and you see her twice in this obelisk. Um, and these images are taken from the far right and the far left um, of, of what you saw in the previous slide. But it was likely the 1763 political cartoon of John Wilkes, drawn by British artist William Hogarth, that linked the Liberty Cap and the Liberty Pole as symbols of political rebellion against tyranny in the latter half of the 18th century. Wilkes was a strong supporter of the American colonists. Indeed, he was jailed for his printed attacks on British royal policy concerning the American colonies. This image became popular in England and in the American colonies. It was produced also on bowls and teapots and uh, ceramics. Liberty trees and liberty poles appeared in towns and villages on the eastern seaboard, a political statement against the abuse of power by the British king and parliament. American liberty caps varied in form from the Roman conical pileus to the Phrygian cap, which you see here. Its tip flips softly over onto the cap itself. The Phrygian cap appears in ancient Greece, Greek art to designate the people from Phrygia, now in modern day Turkey. Over time, this Phrygian cap in Greek art came to designate any person from the north, from northeast of, of uh, Greece um, along the Aegean Sea, and also to designate captive foreign Prisoner. So again, this issue of bondage um, being represented symbolically by this cap. In the 18th century, the meaning of the Pileus as a symbol of liberty and the meaning of the Phrygian cap as a symbol of enslavement or imprisonment were somehow blurred in popular culture. What we see from the American Revolution onward is the use of the floppy tipped Phrygian cap as the symbol of liberty and freedom. The Liberty Cap was adopted in some state flags and on the new nation's coinage, but its double meaning, incorporating both bondage and freedom, was so potent a symbol that when, in the 1850s, at the height of the nation's slavery debate, the figure of freedom was being designed to be placed atop the dome of the National Capitol building in Washington, D.C., no other than Jefferson Davis, then Secretary of War and later President of the Confederate States of America, objected to the inclusion of a liberty cap on the sculpture. This figure, even today, wears a helmet. So this is the political and symbolic world in which Isabella Beecher Hooker was raised. The women's suffrage movement was born within the abolitionist movement Isabella was born into a large family, the members of which espousing to different degrees both causes, though it was through her marriage to attorney and fervent abolitionist John Hooker in 1841 that she took up the anti-slavery crusade. As she made curtains for her family's new house at Nook Farm in Hartford, Connecticut in 1853, muslin and chintz, two sets, Isabella was also surrounded by intellects that matched and spurred her own. As she tended to domesticity, the widely accepted cultural realm of American women, she questioned what she called the differences historically assigned to genders. She wrote to other thought leaders in America. They, in turn, engaged her ideas on women's rights and women's suffrage. In 
By age 60, Isabella Beecher Hooker was stepping into the public realm that her older sisters and brothers had already entered. And by the way, in 1860, she wore bloomers. It would not be until after the American Civil War that Isabella herself fully entered the women's suffrage movement. In 1868, she published a mother's letters to a daughter on women's suffrage, finding her public voice in a private sphere relationship. She began a correspondence with, uh, with um, suffrage leaders Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in 1869 right at the time that the suffrage movement was coming apart over the issue of race. Both Stanton and Antony, who you see in the upper uh, left, were adamant in their criticisms of the proposed 15th Amendment. They and Sojourner Truth, here with her knitting at the bottom left, had campaigned to have women included in the new constitutional amendments giving rights to the formerly enslaved. The 13th Amendment outlawed slavery in 1865. In 1868, the 14th Amendment defined citizenship, but it also added to the Constitution the first mention of gender, referring to voters as, quote, any of the male inhabitants being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States. The 15th Amendment guaranteed the rights of citizens um, to vote shall not be denied or abridged on the account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. This was and is an anti-discrimination law. With the 14th Amendment's definition of voters as male and the 15th Amendment's purpose to end voter discrimination on the basis of race, women's suffrage advocates found themselves in debate. Should they support the law and fight for another amendment to include women in the electorate? Or should they oppose the amendment in the hope of creating one that included women's suffrage? Voting right reformers, such as Frederick Douglass and Lucy Stone, who you see on the right, argued for the 15th Amendment, seeing in it that it was the time for guaranteeing black male voting rights. Yet Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton declared any amendment that did not include women's suffrage was unacceptable. Here, importantly, is where the racism implicit in the abolitionist movement revealed itself. It was one thing to end slavery, but quite another to extend true equality to African Americans. Stanton, for example, argued that, argued, excuse me, that educated white women deserved the vote and that African Americans didn't know the nation's laws and political system. Anthony stated, quote, the old anti-slavery school says women must stand back and wait until the Negroes shall be recognized. But we say, if intelligence, justice, and morality are to have precedence in the government, let the question of women be brought up first and that of the Negro last. Isabel Beecher Hooker, um, here is a lithograph um, from a photograph in 18, of her in 1868. Uh, she joined with Stanton and Anthony in their newly formed National Women's Suffrage Association in 1869. Those suffragists who had urged the passage of the 15th Amendment, on the other hand, created under Lucy Stone the American Women's Suffrage Association. Nevertheless, Isabella independently organized a suffrage convention in Hartford in that same year of 1869 in the hopes of bringing the two factions back together. That effort failed, but another effort, the establishment of the Connecticut Woman Suffrage Association, succeeded at the convention. And it, for decades, provided Isabella the platform to carry on her work. Isabella would provide in various ways leadership for this statewide group for nearly 30 years, from attempting to vote in an election in 1872 to seeing in 1877 the passage of Connecticut's Married Women's Property Tax Law, which allowed a married woman to have her own legal identity to introducing annually to the Connecticut legislature a voting bill. Though she would travel, organize, and lecture on behalf of women's suffrage, Isabella's reputation suffered in the 1880s because of the disarray in the suffrage movement. Not until the two suffrage associations reunited as the National American Women's Suffrage Association 
In 1890, was the movement placed back on track. In 1898, Isabella published a short essay entitled, Are Women Too Ignorant? in response to claims that adding women voters would weaken the nation because the electorate would contain more ignorant voters. In this essay, Isabella re reveals her belief in universal suffrage and equality of the races, classes, and genders. At a time when race relations in the nation were at its lowest and xenophobia was on the rise, Isabella doubled down on her argument that her sisters, regardless of race, class, class, ethnicity, and religion, were well prepared to take up the important duty of citizenship, voting. Here's Isabella's words, here are Isabella's words. Let us take courage, dear sisters, and not allow ourselves to be deluded by the fear that we are not sufficiently educated to take part in public affairs. Responsibility is all the education we need today, and when put to the test, we shall not be found wanting. Yet, in 1903, women suffragists would sign on to a plan to win over the southern states by focusing only on white women's suffrage to get to the 19th Amendment in 1920. We are still left with the mystery of my lady's hat. Did Isabella Beecher Hooker wear this hat? As we have learned, she would have known the meaning of the liberty cap. Nothing I have found so far offers firm evidence that Isabella made it and wore it. In 1869, Isabella writes a letter about her daughter Alice, then an anti-suffrage supporter, acting in a play entitled The Spirit of 76, The Coming Woman. In it, a man returns from a long trip to find the United States embracing full and equal rights for women. Might our liberty cap have played a role in the play, a symbolic prop for this piece of burlesque theater? Or perhaps our liberty cap was created for a pageant and parade, two forms of political theater, theater the American women's suffrage movement embraced after Isabella's death in 1907. If that is the case, and I'm leaning towards this explanation right now, this hat may have been worn by Isabella's granddaughter, Catherine Seymour Day, herself a suffragist. The form of the hat, the, the distinctive curved tip and the use of a tricolor cockade seems an early 20th century update of the French Revolution's bonnet rouge, which had been borrowed from the Americans. Americans did not use the cockade, the French did especially during World War I when nationalistic propaganda in the forms of images and dress sought to unite people to fight, the Liberty Cap appeared on both sides of the Atlantic. Here are two, um, here for example, are American and French war posters. Um, one having um, the image of Marianne, the personification of France, and the other, the personification of Liberty. Um, sleeping um, and um, not aware of the war going on, it seems. Um, and here are two personifications of a modern uh, Marianne, um, and these date from about 1920. The symbolic um, uh, symbolism here being updated um, into what looks, looks to want to be um, a cloche hat, very popular in the 1920s is not too much of a leap to suggest that our liberty cap may date from this time. Dress was a political strategy in the women's suffrage movement. We know that the white upper and middle class women who campaigned for the vote knew they had to look the part when they lobbied state and federal officials. A woman in the halls of government took good care to dress fashionably and modestly to symbolize not radicalism, but rather a respectable femininity. The gentlemen in the halls of Congress removed their hats. Women wore hats in the same public spaces to be noticed. But the same gentlemen who removed their hats to do the work of the nation were not happy to see the hatted women in the Capitol. Alice Paul, co-leader with Lucy Burns, of the Congressional Committee of the National American Women's Suffrage Association and who also co-founded the National Women's Party in 1912, learned from the British suffragettes all manner of political theater to persuade politicians of women's right to vote. 
Alice Paul sent so many suffrage lobbyists to the Capitol that one member of Congress declared that the halls of Congress had been converted into a millinery establishment. Suffragists also dressed for parades. Public decorum in the first decades of the 20th century required that women not merely walk down the street and be confused with women of poor character. Some suffragists, such as Carrie Chapman Catt, refused to participate in such public processions, stating in 1909 that, and I quote, we do not have to win sympathy by parading ourselves like the street cleaning department. The best known women's suffrage parade was held in Washington, D.C. on March 3rd, 1913, the day before the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson. Um, I found this very late in my writing of this. I needed to share this. I found this um, spoof of the women's uh, parade, women's rights parade, um, this wonderful reference to classical symbolism in life. And you see the center figure with the, you know, the Roman um, dress, toga, gown, um, and the Phrygian cap here, the Liberty cap, looking very much with her umbrella like Susan B. Anthony. Um, I just thought it was wonderful. Suffragists organized these parades as theatrical processions attending, every, um, attending to everything. Women marched by state or by occupation. Here you see homemakers marching as a group. So did college students and men's suffrage leagues. In between the marchers were musical bands and floats. Banners, some hand sewn or embroidered, also designated groups and importantly carried messages from and about women. Many marchers also chose to wear specific clothing. White dresses borrowed from the temperance movement were adorned with sashes designating membership. Gold for the National American Women's Suffrage Association and in later events, purple, white, and gold for Alice Paul's National Women's, uh, excuse me, National Women Party. The purple and white in these sashes represented respectively loyalty and purity and virtue. The gold referenced sun, uh, sunflowers, themselves a symbol of Kansas, the first state to consider women's suffrage and where Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton campaigned in 1867. The fact that the suffragists chose a color rather than a type of dress to symbolize the movement meant that more women, whatever their social and economic status, could participate. In a pageant staged at the Department of the Treasury um, during this parade, German actress Hedviga Riker, in the role of Columbia, wore a magnificent helmet in the recognizable form of the Phrygian cap. Recall that the Liberty Cap's meaning combined opposites, bondage and freedom. With Southern opposition to women's suffrage because it would increase the Black vote, parade organizers decided to have African-American women march at the back of the parade. Chicagoan Ida B. Wells Barnett would have none of it. After being refused by the Illinois delegation, Wells Barnett herself refused to march. During the parade, however, she leapt from the crowd and joined the Illinois delegation protected by two white supporters. Over 100 years later, as Americans struggle with the nation's original sin of racism, we would do well to remember the vexed history of women's suffrage and the historical meaning of the Liberty Cap with, this, with its dual meanings of bondage and freedom. Symbols are powerful, more so because unpacking their histories lays bare the contradictions and silences within. So I'd like to leave you with this juxtaposition of coins minted in 2020. On the left, a coin commemorating the centennial of the 19th Amendment, featuring three women wearing fashionable hats representing the generations and races of women fighting to secure the vote. On the right is the American Silver Eagle walking liberty coin using one of the most popular designs on American coinage between 1916 and 1947. Here, Liberty wears a Phrygian cap as she strides into the dawn of a new day. I dearly hope she's going to the polls to vote, and I hope you will proudly wear your Liberty cap and vote too. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Shirley, for that tremendous lecture.
And I take this opportunity also to thank Connecticut Humanities for support of this project, which reminds us so much how women have actively been engaged in politics, whether it's through sewing, through fashion, or symbols. Thank you so much.